All right. Well, as everyone is getting uh, situated, if uh, you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, you can go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, we're going to actually start in verse 53. So Matthew 13, 53. If you're new with us again, thank you, welcome. Uh, you are kind of coming in in the middle of a series that we've been doing in the book of Matthew, and our goal has been to take this pretty large gospel, which is a first century account, historical account of the person of Jesus of Nazareth, and we've been studying it, we've been examining it, we've been talking about it um, over the last several months, and our goal is really to use this as kind of the means of which we prepare our hearts and we build towards uh, Easter, Resurrection Sunday. And so we're hoping to conclude this um, series around Easter. So uh, if you're new with us today, special welcome. Matthew 13, verse 33, or uh, 53, rather. While you're turning there, let me tell you kind of a, a fun, silly story. So it was over 10 years ago, and me and my wife had just gotten married, and I had taken uh, kind of the role of planning the honeymoon. And I was super excited. Um, I'm in a military family. We've lived all around the world. Um, and one of the places, one of my favorites, was Hawaii. And so I had uh, booked a place for us to stay in Hawaii. And as uh, every young man who's just gotten married uh, does, there's certain expectations, dreams, ways you see things playing out, right? And uh, anyway, so our honeymoon was not quite as I was expecting. So first thing was we got there. Uh, fairly late at night, and unlike the pictures on the website, um, our little cabin that we were staying on, I could not have designed a house better with gigantic windows on every side and above and around for anybody, anywhere in the vicinity to be able to look in and see the bed. I'm like, this is not going to work. This is not going to work, right? So <laughs> me and my Poor wife have to take sheets and blankets, and looks like this place is getting fumigated for bugs or something, right? Which wouldn't have been a bad idea, because then that leads to the next part. So um, it was uh, kind of funny, because it's Hawaii, right? So we came for the sunshine. We're from Seattle. It's dark and rainy and depressing all the time, right? Well, turns out that we came in like monsoon season. So pretty much the entire time we're there, it's raining, 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 raining. And so my poor wife's trying to make the best of a bad situation. She falls into the bed and looks up and starts screaming. Because you see, what happens is when it's really raining, all the bugs like to go inside where it's dry. And so when she looks up, our ceiling is covered in creepy, crawly, disgusting, nasty things. So my new wife, my poor wife, is screaming and yelling. I'm like, I'm the husband. I have to save the day. And without thinking, I jump on the bed, take off my sand-encrusted sandal, and go wham, and try and kill the biggest bug I can find on the roof. What happens is by hitting it, all of the bugs and all of the sand go raining down into the bed where Crystal's just, ah, it's just all on her. Right? Like, that's, that's yeah, that could have turned out better. So... We found, um, we found a, a channel on the TV, and it was a, basically a tourist channel, right? And it, and it takes you around the islands like, you can do this, and you can do that. And, and, and they, but they usually say something like, and if it's sunny, you can do this. And poor Crystal's like, it's not sunny. <laughs> so the, the honeymoon did not quite turn out. We had a few nice days towards the end, but it didn't quite turn out the way we were thinking. And the reason I, I share that is because oftentimes we've had this experience where what we think, what we hope, what we dream doesn't tend to line up with reality. Have you ever had that experience? Can I get an amen? Um, so we want, to, we want to align our thinking as closely as we can with the reality of the world that we're in. And in particular, what, what, when we're thinking about the, the book of Matthew and the section that we're going to be in, we want to align our thinking to understand God in the person of Jesus as clearly as we can. Because I think the problem is when we think about Jesus, we don't, our, our minds are not aligned with reality. When you think about Jesus, typically you may think of like, uh, say a, a, a 30-year-old white guy with feathered hair, he's got mascara on, usually holding a heart, right? Tends to be crying, very effeminate, very gentle, you know, long hair, uh, but piercing, kind of creepy blue eyes, right? It's a little freaky. It's a little freaky. And the truth is, 
that there was a, and many of you may be familiar with this, there was a study that happened a while ago, and it was to try to say, like, so what would Jesus most likely look like? And so there, there's most likely our, our Lord and Savior right there, incarnate in the flesh. Do we have a view of God that is alignment with reality? Or does our God believe everything we do, vote the way we do, care about all of our priorities, never contradict us, and is basically a giant reflection of ourselves. Here's the thing. Uh, A.W. Tozer wisely said that what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Uh, R.C. Sproul wrote a systematic theology that he called Everyone's a Theologian. And the point of this that's helpful is that you and I, everyone in this room, everyone you meet is a theologian. Everyone has a view about God. Even if they're, they would call themselves an atheist and deny God's existence, which uh, is fundamentally flawed because essentially to deny something does not exist is to have absolute knowledge of the entire universe. It would be like me saying, there is no rock with a black dot on it anywhere, ever. I don't have that kind of knowledge. So even an atheist, everyone has some understanding or some view or some opinion or some, some concept of who God is or isn't. The question isn't, are you a theologian, but what kind of theologian are you? What are you teaching your kids? What are you teaching your spouse? What are you teaching your friends, your coworkers, your roommates about God? So I want us to think about Jesus, and I want us to think about how we actually see him. Are we rightly aligning ourselves with who Jesus reveals himself to be? What comes into our mind when we think about Jesus? And I want to give you four different reactions based on our text. How will you respond to Jesus? There was the response of familiarity, which is the first one we'll look at. There was the response of fear. There was the response of fascination. And there was the response of faith. So let's pray and we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you would take your word and that you would apply it to our lives to get today, Lord. We, we just, we, Lord, we want to humble ourselves. We don't want to stand over this. We want to submit to it. We believe that the word that spoke the universe into being is speaking to us now. So God, give us everything we need for life, for faith, for godliness. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. All right, familiarity with Jesus. So let's get the story started. If you have your Bibles open, Matthew 13, picking up in verse 30, 53, excuse me, it starts like this. And when Jesus had finished these parables, remember we just came out of the section with the parables. He went away from there and coming to his hometown, that's key, you can underline that or circle that, right? This is his hometown. These are the people he grew up with. This is the old stomping grounds. Everybody knows good old Jesus and his family. It says he went and taught in their synagogue. Important thing again, aligning ourselves with who Jesus is. Oftentimes people will see Jesus and be like, he's so, he's so punk rock, right? He's anti-authoritarian, you know, he does his own thing. He starts his own religion. That's not what we see in the life, in the teaching, in the ministry of Jesus. He goes into the synagogue, as was his custom, as was the custom of Paul and the early missionaries with him. They went into the structures and they preached Christ. And so he says, so they were, uh, they, that is the people listening, were astonished and they said, where did this man get this wisdom? Right? This is the hometown boy. We've all known this guy. How, where did he get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Isn't this Joseph's little boy? Is not Mary, or is not his mother called Mary? Right, we all know Mary. We know Mary and Joseph. Are not his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Are not all of his sisters with us? When then did this man get all of these things? In verse 57, so they took offense at him. Perhaps for some of us this morning, and perhaps for some of those that we know and love, Jesus is just all too familiar. He's just not interesting, not fascinating, not complex, not compelling. He's just Jesus, right? We know Jesus. We grew up with him. And it was interesting. I remember I was at a um, family reunion and my, uh, my nephew, his name is Jonah, was there. 
And we're sitting, my, most of my family lives over on the East Coast, and we're sitting there, one of the things that we love to do, which I highly recommend if you haven't uh, done this yet, is have like a, a crab bank. So you get all these crabs, you just dump them out on uh, paper, you, you know, you season them, and you just spend the next hours cutting your hands and eating delicious meat and talking. And so anyways, so I'm talking to my nephew, and I remember when he was born, and I held him, and he was just like this nasty little like just thing, right? And I'm like, wow, it's a baby. That's amazing, right? And... Uh, and now he's this grown man. He's like in his 20s. I'm like, what? Wow, this is crazy. So we're talking. I, I forget even what the context was that we were talking about. It was something dumb and, and, and fairly insignificant. And I remember talking to him, and he said, well, look at Uncle Kyle. You're entitled to your opinion, but you're completely wrong. And I'm just like, what? Who, who are you? You're the snot-nosed little kid. I changed your diapers. You don't know anything. You're too young to know anything. And... And then all of a sudden, things started to click for me as well. Because I remember in, in more weighty and faith-based matters, I've talked with members of my family and extended family, and they're like, oh, Kyle, I'll always know you as that little kid. And just kind of ruffle your hair and carry on with life. How many of us, there's this old saying, familiarity breeds contempt. How many of us, based on our knowledge of Jesus, maybe you've grown up in the church, maybe you've been in a Christian family, and it's just all so familiar that, quite honestly, it doesn't really have a whole lot of bearing on your life. I remember talking with someone one time, and they're like, yeah, I'm a Christian, and I wanted to sort of push them on that because I didn't see a whole lot of fruit in their lives, and so out of love, I said, so what does that mean to you exactly? And they're like, I'm a good person. A good person is not the definition of a Christian. Did you know that? A good person is not the definition of a Christian. In fact, a Christian would contend with that definition of a good person to begin with. I think for some, the idea of Jesus has become so familiar that it has become sort of cliche. It's as though we're inoculated to this incredible, complex God who became one with us to be like us, to live the life we couldn't, to die the death that we deserve, to be buried and raised again, to be ascended on high where he rules and reigns right now, who will soon return to establish his kingdom forever. Oh yeah, that Jesus. Knowing about him is different than worshiping him, than following him. And look what it says in the text. It says, they took offense at him, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and among his own household. And he did not do any or do, did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. You know, we talked about this throughout the gospel that Jesus' miracles are not just demonstrations of his power, but they're signs to who he is. And so the reason that he doesn't do miracles here is not because he's limited. Oh, shoot, you know, you don't believe, so I'm, 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 I, you know, I'm usually at 100%. He's not like Santa Claus, where he's empowered by people's belief in him, right? <laughs> There's something way deeper going on here. And what it is is that Jesus doesn't do miracles for those who, do, who are already actively in unbelief. Because all a miracle will do is perpetuate the cycle of doubt longer. And for those of you who weren't with us, we've talked about, we've seen this pattern where essentially what Jesus does is he's addressing the elephant in the room that those who doubt him don't want to address. There's more going on than evidence. Because if it is true, then he's in charge and we are not. And so we have a lot to lose. We have a lot to lose. We may say we're, we're unbiased truth seekers, but that is not who we are. The fact is, we prefer to be in charge when we're honest. We prefer to be in charge. And so Jesus, the mighty Jesus, the prophet Jesus, the Messiah Jesus, God incarnate, is now in his hometown, and those who are the most familiar with him are not seeing his power. They're not receiving his words. They're not dwelling in his presence because they've been inoculated to his power through familiarity. Yeah, uh, I'm a Christian. Well, what does that mean to you? I'm a good person. Well, do you believe that Jesus is God? No, not really. Do you believe that he rose from the dead? Absolutely not. Does he have any bearing, does teaching have any bearing on your life? No, not, not so much. Then you're not a Christian. And that's okay, brother, sister, we love you. We're thankful that you're here. 
But what you may have is what has been termed cultural Christianity, meaning that you have the forms and the names, but not the substance. And what I would invite you to is what the Apostle Paul said. He said that our faith is not merely words, but power. But power. And so if you are one of those people who've maybe grown up in a Christian family, maybe you went to youth camp, maybe you raised your hand or prayed the prayer, but it has made no difference in your life, then what I would invite you to this morning is to recognize your vision of Jesus is too small. Your vision of Jesus is too small. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Lord of Lords. Jesus is the resurrected Savior of the world. Here's just one thought to think about this week. Jesus Christ never had a beginning. And you might think, yeah, he did. He was born of Mary. No, he was incarnated. But the Son of God, the eternal Logos, never had a beginning. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. That's the Jesus that we worship. Yes, he incarnated himself. Yes, he was a poor peasant with some amazing teaching. But the reason all of this is so profound and so altering and so history-shaking and so important for you and I is that it, Jesus is God who dwells among us. If you have a small view of Jesus, I would encourage you to get into the scriptures, to get around Christian community, to recognize both who he is and the impact he has on others. Maybe your response to Jesus is fear. This is an interesting story. Verse, uh, this is chapter 14, verse 1. We're going to look at Herod. Herod, you'll notice fear comes up several times. Um, and you can underline all the different times that it says that he's fearful or he's afraid or he was concerned. What's interesting is the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear is essential in you and I's life. The question is not, will I be afraid, but rather, who will I fear? And I would argue that when it comes to God, there are two forms of fear. Either there's a fear, uh, a fear that I don't measure up, that I'm not good enough, that I'm going to have his judgment, or there's a fear of reverence. And it's only through Jesus that we can move from judgment to reverence that we can move from running away to running to, that God goes from being a judge to a father. Let's read this story. It goes this. At, th at that time, Herod the Tetrarch, which we could get into all that, but we'll just keep going. He's a ruler. Uh, he's not a great ruler. He's an evil ruler, as we'll see, and he's not even Jewish. There's, it's a big mess. It says that Herod heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead. That's why these miraculous powers are at work in him. Herod is scared. He's fearful. He's paranoid. And the reason is, Herod has skeletons in the closet. Maybe like you and I. And when it comes to really getting real and really being known, that's a fearful proposition. Look what Herod's baggage and backstory is. Verse 3, it says, For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Okay, we're going, we're going, <laughs> this is going to get a little crazy. Because John had been saying to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. So Herod is, um, well, in fact, I, I, I was reading through, um, many of us have been going through the Bible in a year, and I just finished up Leviticus. Leviticus 18 has um, essentially sexual prohibitions. And one of them is that you, is exactly this situation. You should not, and it doesn't say we use the nomenclature in our society, sleep with, which just sounds so friendly. Uh, Leviticus says you should not uncover their nakedness. Which sounds very um, predatorial. And it's interesting because John sees that Herod the king is in violation of God's rule. And many of you might be thinking, well, separation of church and state, this wasn't John's place, he should just mind his own business, stay involved in the church, and not care about the king and the ruler. And here's what I would encourage you to think. If, that, if that's your mindset, I'd encourage you to see that God has created different institutions, the institution of the family, the institution of the church, and the institution of the state, all of which were instituted by him and held accountable from him. And will give or bear an account to him. And so if you look at places like Psalm 2, where the, the kings of the earth 
are plotting and they're saying, let's break God's bonds. Let's do our own thing. Let's rule. And it says that God laughs and he holds them in derision. As Christians, we are always to be, as part of the church, we are to be a prophetic opposition to the state. We're to call the state to godliness and to repentance because the state will have to give an account. The state as created by God. The state in Romans, uh, it, it, it outlines the obligations of the state and it says that God has given us the state to essentially to um, administrate justice. Romans says they do not bear the sword in vain. So the, the church does not bear the sword, the state does. The church bears the word and we're to be a prophetic witness to all people, including the state. Don't allow this idea of the separation of church and state to somehow make you think that not all legislation is inherently moral. There is always a God in the system. There is always something that is supreme. John calls Herod out. He says that it is not lawful. It is not right. It is not God-honoring. And here's what happens. It's not lawful for you to have him or her. And though he wanted to put him to death, so Herod wants to kill John. He feared, there's fear again. He feared the people because they held John to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, which is a little interesting thing because at that time, Jews didn't celebrate birthdays. Greeks did. So it's showing you he's not really the king of the Jews. When Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias, this would be his stepdaughter. This gets very Jerry Springer very quickly danced before the company and pleased Herod. I can only imagine that when it says danced, you, you know, fill in the blank. So he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. You know, one practical implication of this, I'll just say this real quick. Lust makes you stupid. I have seen this over and over and over again. Lust makes you stupid. It makes you do stupid things. It makes you think stupid things. It makes you a fool. And what I find so often is that men and women are like, you know what? I can control this. It's not a big deal. Here's the reasons why. And the Bible says to flee. To flee. The way I talk with, the way I talk with younger men, I find this to be really helpful, is I talk about a fire. Fire's really great in the fireplace. Not so great on a table, the chairs, the wall, the ceiling, right? And so the, the scripture in Proverbs talks about, can a man hold fire next to his lap and not expect to get burnt? God's made, and it's a good gift. You need to hear this, because too often in the church, it's like, that's the thing we don't speak of. How inappropriate. Sex is a good gift given by God in the, the loving confines of covenantal marriage. And whenever you are provoked, whenever lust is at hand, Flee, the scripture says, because it makes you stupid. And here, Herod, who is not a godly man, over and over again, he's fearful, he's lustful, he's greedy. This is just a smorgasbord of all sorts of evil. It says, so he promised with an oath, <laughs> which is another thing that you're not supposed to do, to give her whatever she asks. Just a bad idea in general. Probably you should never go up to someone and be like, I'll just anything, anything at all. The only person in the universe that you should say that to is God, is God himself. And so prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And then the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, so he's fearful of the people around him, uh, he, com uh, he commanded it to be given. And he sent and had John beheaded in prison. Our mighty prophet, the one that the story picked up with, is now has the most indecent and awful ending. He was beheaded in prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came, and they took the body, and they buried it, and then they went and told Jesus. He is so fearful that at the end, Herod is faced with an obligation. Either I please these people and I put God's prophet to death, or I say no. You know, what's interesting is that we see in the trajectory of Herod, there have been multiple times where he was called to faithfulness, where he was called to repentance, where he was called to make the right decision, and each time he double downs again. And here's what I want you to know, 
And I think it's the greatest lie of the enemy. The enemy will tell the, maybe yourself, certainly the people you interact with, your neighbors, your coworkers, your extended family. He'll tell them that God could never love them. He'll tell them that they're unworthy. If only people knew what they did, they're a hypocrite and a liar. They could never darken the door of a church. Who are they to ever even explore who God is with all that they've done? And what I, I need you to know because of the good news of the gospel, we're a good news people. Sin doesn't exclude you from the church. It qualifies you. If you're here this morning, you feel like, man, I'm unworthy. I feel like if anyone even knew my backstory and what I've done, they would never want to even talk to me. They'd never want to include me. I shouldn't even be here. And what I would tell you is that we are all here because we believe that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You are not in a, a group of perfect people. You're in a hospital with those who are being healed by the grace and mercy of Jesus. And so, will you fear your family? Will you fear others? Will you fear what people will think of you? Or will you fear God? And in fearing him and giving him referential treatment and putting him in the center of your life, you can experience healing, forgiveness, and the hope of the gospel. When you put your trust in Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation. And that voice inside, you can begin to combat with the blood of Christ who died in your place for your sins. Maybe for you, it's not, it's not fear. Maybe it's just fascination. Maybe you're checking out church and the scripture and Jesus and you're just super intrigued. Maybe you've been with us the past couple of weeks. Maybe you're in one of the programs. Maybe you live around here and you've just been listening and you're just like, this is kind of fascinating. I didn't know that Jesus, you know, that was his teaching. I didn't know that comes from the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe you're just one of those many who follow Jesus with fascination. Let's pick it up in the, in the story. Verse 13, now, when Jesus heard of this, that's the death of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. He's trying to get away. He's trying to grieve. He's trying to mourn. This is his cousin. This is a dear friend. This is a ministry co-worker who has been executed. But when the crowd heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore, he's trying to get away. He's trying to get some time to himself. He's trying to relax and pray and process. And the crowd hears and they follow and they show up before him. And I love this. This is our Savior. This is our Lord. This is the one we follow. When he went ashore, he saw the crowd. And instead of, oh, man, turn this boat around or any of that, he had compassion on them. And he healed their sick. Jesus gives and gives and gives and gives. Now, and, and notice this, verse 15. Now when it was evening, he's been doing this the entire day when he wanted to just grieve and break down and be alone. He's willing to have compassion and he's willing to engage and love others. It says, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves <laughs> and good old Jesus. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. What? Can you only imagine? Uh, the scholars uh, speculate, says there's 5,000 men, so plus women and children. We're looking at a good crowd here. A good crowd, right? This is you being at, it's no longer Safeco, T-Mobile Field. This is you being at one of those games and imagine you're like, you're tasked with Jesus says, you go feed everyone here. Like, um... <laughs> Okay, they said to him, we only have five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them to me. Jesus takes what little we have and he'll multiply. I love this. He ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he said a blessing. Those are going to be words that um, if you've been on a computer and you've gone on Wikipedia and you're reading an article and then there's those hyperlinks embedded in. And it's like, oh, I want to learn about this. And you click on that, and you, you, know, you find yourself two hours later, like, what have I done with my life, right? <laughs> this is what's happening right there. This is a hyperlink in the scriptures. You're going to see this pop up, boom, 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 over and over and over again. He looked up to heaven, and he said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples. This is foreshadowing that his body will be broken, that he will be our sustenance. 
And then it says, he broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowd. It's interesting because Jesus has compassion on the people, but look at the means by which that compassion flows to everyone. Here's the truth. God shows compassion through us. Through us. You and me are the instruments by which God does most of his work on this earth. He doesn't need us, but in his grand scheme, in his plan, it pleases him to use us. I've heard one preacher say it this way, God loves to draw straight lines with crooked sticks. He loves to use you and me. So he uses the disciples. They give to the crowd as much as they can eat. And God shows compassion to you and I. God uses us to show compassion to others. The Bible says that you and I are to visit the sick, to visit those who are in prison, to care for widows and orphans, to mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. That is what the body of Christ is. He shows compassion through you. So I would ask, as you think about your life, is the compassion of God flowing through you to others? How are you demonstrating the reality of God's compassion right now? I would encourage you, God is not looking for ability, but availability. Are you willing? Whether it's your time, your money, or your stuff. (laughs) One person said it this way. If you have enough to spare, you have enough to share. Is the compassion of God flowing through you to others? Here's the truth. What we believe looks most beautiful when we live according to it. So there's a watching world out there. When we finish our service today and we go out to a restaurant or go back to our home for food, when we go to our workplaces and our schools tomorrow, people are going to look at us and they're going to be learning about who God is from the way we live. I'm not telling you this. Here's what I don't want you to think. Well, I have to go do something compassionate this week, right? I'm going to take a picture of it. I'm going to hashtag it compassion. I'm going to feel so good about myself, right? It's going to be fantastic. You're the truth of the gospel. People can deny it. They can resist it. But they cannot get away from it when they see it worked out in your life. I remember when I was a young man, I, was, uh, I grew up in the church. I had many things happen to me. It was really bitter. I wanted nothing to do with God, nothing to do with church people. I got dragged to, many of you heard this story, so bear with me for a moment. I got dragged to a youth group. I thought it was so dumb. I was just like, oh, this is awful. So immature. They're spelling joy out with their bodies. They're bobbing for apples. I'm like, what does this have anything to do with God? Nobody's, everyone's ignorant. Blah, blah. And uh, we went into a discussion time. And as soon as they're like, well, Kyle, what do you think? I'm like, you're all dumb, and here's why. How can I get a lot of evil? Blah, 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 blah. And so much of it was not justifiable. Some of it was, but so much of it was just anger and bitterness and frustration. And I remember there's one one, uh, young man. His name was Gabe. Gabe was a wonderful, godly man. And he just sat with me, and his poor wife was there, (laughs) till like two in the morning, and just absorbing so much of my anger and hatred and bitterness and frustration, and just gently correcting his opponents with gentleness just sort of turning everything. And here's the thing. I walked out of there, and I still had a bunch of reasons why I thought Christianity was wrong and everyone was stupid. Um, But I could not deny the compassion that he showed me. I could not deny it. And when so many other people had just turned the other way and be like, young, dumb kid, just go, you know, blow off steam on the internet or something like, you know, go yell at somebody else. Instead, he sat with me and he absorbed it and he took it and he answered and he worked with me and he was patient. And in those moments, I may have not known it at the time, I may have not known it for years, but I was experiencing God's compassion through someone else. It was as though Jesus was there with me, gently instructing, encouraging, rebuking, correcting, patience, 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 and mercy. You can be the compassion of God in somebody else's life. They all ate and were satisfied. All of them ate and were satisfied. There's, we already talked about how many people that probably is. Um, and what I want you to see again is, you know, people often throughout this series and uh, just in life, people will talk about, well, Jesus' miracles are lame, right? You know, we've talked about this. Why couldn't he shoot lasers out of his eyes? Why couldn't he talk about quantum physics? Then I would believe him. Then I would know he's really God. 
But again, his miracles are always a signpost. What he's doing is he's taking the regular world and he's demonstrating spiritual realities with it. So everyone eats and is satisfied, stuffed, filled up to the brim. Jesus is showing us that Jesus is, he is the provision. And in his kingdom, his coming kingdom, no one will go hungry. Jesus' provision is unending, unrestrained, unrestricted, unrelenting, undiminishing, never-ending, eternal, and infinite. There is no lack in our God. There is no bottom. You never get to the end. There is no shortage, no inability, no limit to who Jesus is and his provision for us. Jesus satisfies. He satisfies us with his truth. He satisfies us with his forgiveness. He satisfies us with his hope. He satisfies us with his presence by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is here even this morning. I remember there was a man I was talking with who was struggling with um, a, a horrible incident that had happened in his life, great suffering, a tragedy. And I remember he looked at me and confided in me, and he said, Something along these lines. He said, I don't understand why God allowed this, but I have never felt closer. I have never felt more comforted. And I have never been more aware of the peace of Jesus than I am right now. God satisfies us with his presence and his peace in the midst of some of the most difficult circumstances in our lives. And so it goes on, it says, they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over, and those who all ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So there are 12 baskets, that means every disciple, every distributor of the compassion grace of Jesus now gets a little doggy bag as remembrance. And think about this for a second. Those of you who maybe struggle with a familiarity with Jesus, with a, a, a Jesus that's too small, You've heard this miracle a million times. You're like, yeah, 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 okay, I get it. He feeds everyone. But just think about this for a second. They get 12 baskets, one for each of the disciples. Think about the precision and complexity of all this. It's astounding. God uses an infinite number of contingent factors. How many people? How much will they eat? When will they feel full? Who will get seconds? He knows all of that and perfectly establishes his providence and will so that each disciple gets a to-go box to remember his power. The truth is Jesus provides for us every meal, every single meal. Think about this. Whatever you go and eat today for lunch, the seeds grew, they were harvested, packaged, shipped, prepared. You may buy them, you may prepare them, but Jesus provided your meal today. So as you eat this afternoon, remember it's his providence. It's his goodness. It's his mercy. It's his common grace. As you go from here today and you see the wonders of Mount Rainier, you behold the beauty of the Puget Sound. You look at the skies and the clouds. You look at your spouse or maybe your kids. You just enjoy the sweetness of a good meal. Know that it was given to you first, fully, and finally by the creator of all things, by Jesus Christ. And the author of Matthew, Matthew himself, one of the disciples, it's interesting because there's this crazy miracle, and he doesn't take a lot of time in the text to try and convince us. Oh, here's why you can believe it's real. He just assumes that it happened because he was there, and he saw it. Whole towns, religious leaders, the enemies of Jesus, seekers, skeptics, critics, fans, everyone was there, and they all saw the miracle, and it just happened. How will you respond? Will your fascination move to faith? Will your interest become commitment? Will you move from observing to following? Finally, and hopefully, everyone's view of Jesus, rightly aligned, rightly understood from Scripture, the final response to who Jesus is should be that of faith. Look at this last story. Many of you may be familiar with it if you have a history in the church. It goes like this. Immediately, he made the disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. 
on the sea. Amazing, awesome, astounding. I love the way Job 9, 8 says, God alone stretches out the heavens and walks on the waves of the sea. Jesus is God. But that's not what the disciples thought, at least not at first. Verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, just like Herod was, thinking about Jesus. And they said, it's a ghost, just like Herod did. Ghosts are showing up a lot in this text this morning. And they cried out in fear. Can you imagine this for a second? Just picture this for a second. Have you ever seen 12 grown men, grizzled sailors and fishermen, screaming in fear? That might be the picture. Is your Jesus too safe? Is your view of Jesus one that would make grown men cry in fear? Most of us think of Jesus as that white guy wearing eyeliner, has really nice nails, feathered hair. He's just a super great guy. But we would never think Jesus is God with us, and he has such power that the wind and the waves obey him. Jesus isn't just a little bit bigger and better than us. He is entirely and altogether different. Jesus is eternal, as I spoke earlier. That means he never had a beginning. He is uncreated. He is causeless. He is absolute reality. Jesus is all-knowing. All of the information on the internet... All of the information and all the books in your library and in all the libraries and the Library of Congress and all of the human knowledge combined since the beginning of history is like a little drop in the bottle compared to the knowledge of God. Jesus has all authority. We see it in this text. He has authority over water, over hurricanes, over floods, over blizzards, over kings and presidents and countries and governments and terrorists. No one can say, uh, say no one can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Absolute sovereign authority. And he is absolutely holy. He had never sinned, never once sinned, never had a millisecond of a thought of lust or greed, or indifference, or laziness. He never lied. He never dishonored his parents. He never stole. Never, 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 never. He is perfectly just. He will render all accounts. He will provide perfect justice. People will ask, where is your Jesus? Where is God? Why hasn't he come back? We will see our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted and harmed. And we will say, because he has not responded yet does not mean he will never respond. Because there will come a day when he will call all to account. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Jesus is also mercifully patient. He's endured you and me for decades. He makes the sun rise in the sky over Seattle even with all of our wickedness. I mean, can you think about that? Sometimes I just drive and I'm praying and I'm just, I'm so astounded by God's grace to us. It's so merciful that some would say, he doesn't even exist because he has such a gentle light hand. Even in all of our wickedness, he causes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust. As Abraham Kuyper, the famous Reformed Dutch theologian, once said, there is not one square inch in all of creation that the Lord Jesus doesn't cry out, mine, absolute sovereignty. And although it might not seem to you that he holds such supreme rule now, it is but a short time in the span of eternity before he returns and he makes his rule and reign and kingdom and power as evident as a man walking on water. It is only a matter of time before we will have that same astonishment as the disciples. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. All of that power is towards us, not against us, who believe in him by faith. And Peter answered him, and I love this, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come, do you guys know that our call as disciples is to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and then to do what Jesus did? Is your impulse when you hear about Jesus to say, I can do it too. The same spirit is in me. He's my Lord and my rabbi and I'm his disciple. I love that Jesus has the boldness to get out of the boat. And here's what I would ask you. 
What's God calling you to? What is God calling you to? And you may look at the storm and the waves and, and, and be fearful. And Jesus is overcoming all of that and he's calling you out. Do you have the courage to jump out of the boat? Do you have the courage to step out into what he's called you to do? So Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came to Jesus. The miracle and power and authority of Jesus is being delegated, being imputed, being given, being shared with Peter. Peter is walking on the water. And do you know what? When you confess your sins... When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, when you're baptized, when you begin to live in community, that same power that Peter was experiencing and walking in the water is the power that you and I experience. You will do things that you said, I could never do that, and you're absolutely right because it's the power of God at work in you. And it's a miracle, a miracle, a miracle. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And I just want to say this too. For those of you in here who feel like your life is sinking, all you have to do is cry out and look immediately at what happens. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And I wonder how you hear that. I wonder if you hear him go, oh, you of little faith. Or I wonder if you hear him with that heart of compassion when he was just trying to get away, and yet he heals all who are broken. Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? Is your view of God a tyrant who's screaming and yelling at you to do better and try harder? Or is he a father that, as their their son or daughter is learning to walk, doesn't yell at them when they fall over, but rejoices with every step? Our God has so much mercy and compassion on us. When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those who were in the boat worshipped, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. So this morning, as you think about Jesus, are you familiar with Jesus? Does it all just seem, yeah, I've heard that before. What does it matter? What's the difference does it make? If you are familiar with Jesus this morning, I want to invite you to meditate on the attributes, or as Jonathan Edwards would say, the excellencies of God, that he is all-knowing, that he is eternal. I want you to just dwell on those things. You could pick up um, A.W. Tozer's book, The Attributes of God, and just reflect on who God is and allow God to expand your understanding. Maybe if you're here this morning and you're feeling fearful, you're afraid, You're afraid to be known. You're afraid to grow. You're afraid to really, truly have faith. Then I would encourage you to see the grace, the mercy, and the patience of God. Jesus is so gentle. Remember a few weeks ago, a burning wick he will not extinguish. He is so gentle with us. Maybe if you're here this morning and you're just fascinated, you're intrigued, and you're interested, here's what I would say. Cross the line of faith and follow him. It might not always be easy, but it is always worth it. And then finally, if you're here this morning and you have faith, then I would encourage you, as we've seen Jesus walk on water and feed the 5,000, as we've seen him do wonders and miracles, as we've contemplated who he is, the only fitting response is worship because he is worthy. So we want to sing. We want to rejoice. We want to praise him for who he is. Amen, church? Amen. I'll pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word, and I thank you for the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. God, I pray that we would have a right view of who Jesus is. Lord, I pray if we're too familiar, shake us up, change our understanding, call us out of mere Christian culture into a vibrant faith. Lord, if we're fearful, I pray that you would bring comfort this morning, that you, through your Son, died in our place for our sins so that we can be forgiven. God, if we're fascinated, Lord, I pray for those who are maybe pushing in for the first time, Lord, I pray that you would give them the gift of faith and that they would follow you for their whole life. And God, for those of who know you and love you, Lord, I pray that today we could rejoice. You're working in our church. You're raising up leaders. You're bringing folks in. You are so faithful and good to fulfill your word to us. And so God, help us to just bring more joy more holiness and happiness as we follow after you. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen.